Today, I'm, I am presenting a reworked and culled down 35-page research paper. It is, it's, it is a discourse analysis of Hebrews based on systemic functional linguistics. I submitted the final editing um, at the end of July, and it will be published in an edited volume called Discourse Analysis of New Testament Writings. But the, but the material is drawn from my published dissertation. And that is a discourse analysis of a letter to Hebrews, the relationship between form and meaning. So the assigned task of this paper was to make a, a very technical linguistic analysis accessible to a broader public and to reduce what was originally 421 pages down to 15 to 30 pages. So it was quite a task. I find it uh, more difficult to be, I think, brief than to uh, have a lot of words and explanation. Uh, but, but the research I'm talking about today is also directly related to other work that I have done in the past and, and works in progress right now. I will be touching on concepts that are directly related to the groundwork laid uh, for Paul and Gender and many of the uh, tools that I used in, in, in making the analyses that I did in that book. Um, for those of you who are so kind as to read that work um, and or to attend the SATS webinar in July 2019, uh, you might remember my dominant passion for establishing the coherence of scripture in problem passages. And, and you might recognize the consistency in how I, I attempt to do that, the methods that I use. The underlying analysis of the Greek um, it, that, that is behind, behind this study is, brought, is going to be and being brought forward into the Hebrews Baylor Handbook um, of New Testament Greek. And the concepts that I'm going to be talking about are going to be made, hopefully, even more accessible in the New Covenant Commentary on Hebrews. And I think some of the reworking that I'm doing today will uh, contribute to uh, my uh, discourse analysis volume in the Baker Greek Grammar series. So all of these are projects underway. I, First, want to start with kind of creating a narrative around how I came to write a discourse analysis of Hebrews, how this all started in my PhD work. And so the question uh, that many might ask is, why Hebrews? Um, in my experience, um, some PhD students uh, come to their work and they have a text or a biblical issue that they really want to understand. Uh, others have a methodology that they want to apply to the Bible. Um, I call that, I have a hammer and I'm looking for a nail. For me, I started with a, an entire book that I wanted to understand better. The book of Hebrews utterly entranced me from the first time I read it with its really amazing and inspiring content. But as, I, but as I studied it, I found that commentaries, uh, sermons, um, any discussions on the book of Hebrews were confused and confusing about the structure of Hebrews. And they, they generally could not account for all the parts of the book, even though they claimed to know what it was about. The, the proposed topics or in translations, the subheadings uh, just didn't really fit the way the book was organized. And, and, uh, and they all knew it. And it led to confusion in the reading. It, it, it seemed incomprehensible at points. Um, things didn't fit together. It was quite, it's quite common for commentators to actually claim that the author of Hebrews just consistently goes off topic or that he has two streams of arguments running at the same time and goes back and forth between them, and they're only tangentially connected. Um, and as I read Hebrews for myself, the conviction grew with me that that scholarship 
and commentators and Bible translators were consistently missing the point. And, they, and that was why they were saying that the author of Hebrews was constantly going off topic. They were missing the topic. And so um, I uh, began to study it for myself and think, is there a coherent way to understand a book that everyone is claiming is the most artistic work in the New Testament? Um, and some people have said, this is, this is the first literary masterpiece and the only literary masterpiece in the New Testament. Well, how could such a literary masterpiece be constantly going off track and have, or have two arguments going at the same time that are only tangentially linked? So that brings me to my next point, uh, why discourse analysis? I had a text, I had a research question, and it started to dawn on me what the problem might be. I was coming to believe, and, and this happened because of teaching and preaching through Hebrews, I came to believe that the message of Hebrews was actually located in the commands, or what usually is called the exhortation or Piranesis, and that the doctrinal exposition was actually support material for the exhortation. Virtually everyone else had assumed that the message of Hebrews was, is theological. Um, after all, it gives us some of the very deepest teaching that we have in the Bible about the person of Christ. We draw some of our major uh, Christology from the book of Hebrews. Um, so. Most people wouldn't even dream to say that the book is actually not about this deep theology that the church has benefited so much from. But I started re realizing that the exhortation might be the point when I started teaching through the first chapter. And I was looking at this comparison between angels and Jesus, the Son, and I was thinking, at that time, I couldn't figure out how I was going to apply this. What, what good application could I give to the people I was teaching about this comparison with angels? And I was teaching in the inner city. I thought my students could care less about the fact that Jesus was better than angels. And th they would accept that anyway. So I was thinking, how can I apply this? What can I say? And all of a sudden, I realized that the application was right there in the text, in the following verses. And I totally had never read it that way, and I had missed it because um, I had, because of the subheadings, it, it seemed to disconnect um, Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 from the first chapter. And so I started looking at it again, and I, I said, you know what? I actually think the point of the first chapter is in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. And then when I continued teaching and I got to the next, next exhortation, the same exact thing happened, that the author actually gave the application, and then it all of a sudden looked like the application was the point. So all of a sudden, I started looking at Hebrews differently. But how could I approach such a controversial thesis uh, that runs against the grain of past scholarship in a convincing way. I, I, I needed a methodology with which I could demonstrate or uncover the patterns that I saw, and I could talk about them in a scholarly way that would, that would um, actually be accessible to the academic community. I found my answer in discourse analysis. Discourse analysis is a linguistics-based approach that is dedicated to looking at patterns above the sentence level of a text. And there are all kinds of tools that are available for the analysis of the, those patterns. It was perfect for what I wanted to do. But I actually managed to write an entire thesis on the discourse analysis of Hebrews by using a potpourri of tools for analysis and avoided not probably not intentionally, but avoided learning much linguistic theory and depth. Um, and I never developed a consistent procedure uh, for my methodology. 
So when I uh, went, went on for my dissertation, and there's a long story about that, but um, I ended up working with Stan Porter, uh, who was in the UK at that time at the, at the um, Institute of Roehampton that become, became connected with the University of Surrey. Surrey. So when I went to uh, work with Stan Porter at my very first meeting, I learned the importance of the role of theory. I actually brought my thesis with me and gave him a copy, and it had not been used to apply to any program. I had just done it um, under the supervision of Craig Blomberg, and, uh, but it had not been applied to, um, to any degree. And so I, I, I gave it to him, and he looked at it, and, and he said, Cindy, I could give you your doctorate right now for this work. Uh, but uh, it's a strong explanation of what's going on in Hebrews. So you've told me a lot about Hebrews, but you don't have a transferable methodology that's linguistically consistent. So you have a choice. I could, I could give you your doctorate, or you could study a school of linguistics and develop a methodology of discourse analysis that you could apply to other texts as well. And so, well, it should be obvious that I made the choice to uh, study with Stan Porter and learn to love systemic functional linguistics. Um, that's which we, we affectionately call SFL. Um, it has been a gift to focus on the theory of language and how it works. And, it's a, and it's a, as I say on my slide, it is a gift that keeps on giving in my scholarship, my work in the academy, my teaching, and my mentoring. So I chose, I chose Systemic Functional Linguistics, SFL, but um, if any of you know anything about that, I'm going to avoid uh, using a lot of technical um, terms today because I don't think they will commit, uh, they will contribute anything to my communication with you. I think it will just end up um, being kind of incomprehensible. It will sound like I'm throwing a lot of jargon out there. So I'm going to be very minimalist in using uh, technical terms. So utilizing SFL. There are many things you, that you can analyze with discourse analysis. Discourse analysis is, is a mini splintered approach. Uh, but I wanted to focus on a relatively common goal of discourse analysis in biblical studies and translation. I wanted to describe a mental representation of the text that is memorable. That, that is something that a, re, that, that a reader can read the text and then come away from it and say, in relatively simple terms that they can remember, this is what the book of Hebrews is about. I always ask my students when they do analysis uh, this question, what's the exegetical payoff? And this is something that people ask about discourse analysis a lot. Is uh, A lot of times discourse analysis seems to pe uh, people to be a lot of analysis and very little payoff. Uh, but the, uh, the exegetical payoff for my methodology and analysis um, was intended to be and and what and is a structure or outline of the discourse of, of Hebrews that represents its meaning. So my thesis is that the patterns of the author's choices of grammar and vocabulary would reveal the mental representation of the text at the discourse level. I hope you got that. That is the formal features of the text. Study, studying the formal features of the text would reveal the patterns that would give me the outline of my text. Um, that, that the author was going to put those signals in the text. And that is as opposed um, to maybe presuppositions that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to this uh, work looking for chiasms that aren't apparent. Uh, rather, I'm going to study the text, and I'm going to start with the text and let the patterns of the text inform me. Another question that I ask my students is, what counts for evidence? And this is, this is a key question. I ask it constantly. What counts for evidence? Uh, so there are four uh, key linguistic concepts associated with the tools that I use 
with which the patterns of the text are analyzed. So the first uh, key concept is cohesion. The question that the que basic questions for cohesion is what are the basic units? And I use lots of words for that. I'm going to give you just a little jargon. One of the words, one of the really complex words we like to use is chunking. How does the author chunk the text? And it's assumed uh, that all authors chunk the text in, in uh, bites that are suitable for, say, for digestion, for reading. You know, we just don't have this big, long clump but we break our we break our communication up into manageable parts and this pretty much is true across languages and across culture so uh, what you determine what are the basic units and you could call them paragraphs and uh, you can call them sections so you you can uh, the the you could talk subunits but um, you have uh, sm the smaller units and the smaller units often combine into larger sections uh, and then the discourse might be composed of several sections the other question about um, cohesion is of course what you need to answer the first is that how then does the author form the basic units in the text what tools is he using and um, and yet I, I will use he here even though I, I could use she I am fairly convinced that the author of Hebrews is a is a man but if we're talking about text in general of course it would be he or she but 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 how does the individual author choose to form each unit and you don't assume that that they use uh, Western conventions to form units. You don't assume that uh, they use the same techniques in each case to form each unit, but you let the text speak to you, and um, and you let the text indicate uh, what, how the unit is formed. And indeed, the Hebrews author uses a number of, diff of different techniques to form units. The next key concept is topic. And topic is simply what is talked about in the unit. I'm going to give you a, a warning here: is that I made a slight mistake in in the um, in the uh, PowerPoint, and sometimes um, I use different different words for um, say what we might call the topic of the discourse. I call those themes, and the topic is something a little bit different when I'm talking about the topic of a unit. The topic of a unit is basically the, 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 the subject of what's being talked about um, just at this time, but we, I talk about themes at the discourse level, and so I use somewhat different language. It probably won't confuse you too much. Uh, but it's simply what's being talked about, and there are certain tools. There, there, there are certain tools that count, that uncover the evidence that answer that question. It's not always the same way, uh, not always the same patterns that indicate the topics. Um, different arguments are are um, constructed in different ways and reveal the topic in different ways. The third key concept is prominence. And prominence is uh, simply what is highlighted as mainline material in the unit or in the section as well. Um, say, you look at things like, is there a marked conclusion? And one of the neat things about the Greek language is there are so many conjunctions, and a number of them mark conclusions that are called inferential conjunctions. So every time you have an inferential conjunction, that is a marker of prominence. Um, but there are many, many other ways that material is highlighted as main line um, in all languages. Uh, and usually for, for something to be uh, considered main line, you need to have a whole cluster of, of what we can call emphatic or marked features of the text. It's not just one. You don't just say, okay, um, we think that the perfect uh, tense is emphatic, so every time we have a perfect, that's pro that's prominent. Well, it creates, it creates emphasis, it creates a contouring of prominence, but what I was always looking for was what's the main clause? What's the most emphatic, uh, emphasized part of each unit? 
But then, and then, I always consider this as a part of prominence, but I, uh, you know, what, what it leads to is what's the point then of the, u of, of the unit or what's the relationship between the topic and the message? Because what's interesting is that the uh, topic that's being talked about is not always the point of the unit because it can go on about topic and then conclude with, now the point I'm making is this, the Hebrews author does this all the time. That is, and, and so that's one of the things that has been confusing to Western scholarship and Western readers. We always look for the main point in the beginning of the unit. So once, uh, so so we at the beginning, what's the point? That must be what's being talked about. And then if the uh, if the unit ends with something that's different than what the first point was, then we think it's off topic. But in in other um, in in other languages uh, languages and cultures, a lot of times the main point comes at the end, and and it, and that, this is indeed what happens with Hebrews. It's not constructed by Western conventions of writing, and that's one of the reasons why there's been so much confusion about it. I maintain. So, the fourth um, key concept is uh, what is the relationship of the unit to the co-text uh, or, or, you know, the surrounding text or the rest of the discourse. And um, that is extremely important because what goes before can constrain a unit's meaning. Like if the terms or the, the, the people talked about or the um, icons talked about in the unit have already been talked about, then that defines the meaning of that term or that person or that unit in, in, the, in the unit that you're reading about. So uh, what entities, vocabulary, semantic domains, and grammatical patterns are repeated? And um, a lot of times people don't think the repetition of grammatical patterns are significant. But in my work in discourse analysis, I found that authors uh, use the repetition of grammatical patterns to, for many purposes, uh, they, can, they can chunk the discourse by the repetition of grammatical patterns. They can create mainline material and, and the theme of the discourse by repeating grammatical patterns and vocabulary together. So, and then, so how do the patterns in the discourse relate to each other to form a mental rep, uh, representation? The, I always like to talk to the, the students to come up with a procedure uh, to, to, in their methodology. And so the procedure uh, for my analysis um, is to work systematically through the discourse and with the four steps that correspond to the four key concepts and tools. So the foundational first step is to find out how each part of the discourse is grouped or chunked through the analysis of cohesion patterns. I don't mean I go through the whole discourse um, and determine the cohesion patterns. I guess I could do that, but I actually start with saying, okay, What's the first unit? And once I, I, I determine through co cohesion patterns, which are predetermined, I mean, I say I'm looking for certain things that glue the unit together. Before I even look about look at my concept of what I think the meaning of the of the unit is, I have to determine what the unit is. And uh, this is where I think many people have fallen uh, fallen astray is that they have not looked at the cohesion patterns to start with. Uh, but but it, you, you have to have um, the, the grouping or the unit in order to answer the questions of what's the topic and what's the most emphatic part of the unit. So um, what features glue the units of the text together apart from any notions of topic or argument? And that unit that is established is then analyzed for, for its topic and its prominence. 
That is, what is the main clause in the unit that is highlighted and supported by the other material? So I added in um, on this slide a message. I have cohesion, topic, prominence, message, and relationship to context. So I actually have five parts. I, th I think it helps the reader to say, OK, this is the point. After I look at the cohesion, topic, and prominence, um, I am honing in at that point on what the message of that unit is. I have got a very good idea of determining the message or what Haddon Robinson calls the big idea. If you want to preach a sermon and you want to find what the big idea of the unit is, I get that uh, by the time I've worked carefully through the cohesion, the topic, and the prominence. Um, and then... Um, so, so this is determined by the relationship between the topic and, um, and uh, the prominence or the prominent cause in the unit. Like I say, okay, what's being talked about? What's prominent? And now what's the relationship between what's being talked about and what's prominent material, often marked as conclusion uh, that's grounded on the preceding material? And so, you know, or you can say, what's the point? What's the point of this unit that the author uh, is trying to make and wants you to carry forward? So the fourth step is to analyze the relationship of this unit to the rest of the discourse. Um, is the vocabulary or are the grammatical patterns repeated elsewhere? One of the most obvious things about Hebrews is the fact that there is so much repetition in the text that to Western scholars and readers, the text seems to go in circles. And it seems to repeat its themes over and over again and, um, and uh, in different ways and, and, and in ways that are entirely consistent with Western conventions. And so uh, some, some um, authors and scholars like Paul Ellingworth just despair of even finding a structure because of all the repetition. And they say, you know what, we've just got to be agnostic about structure. But in some sense, the fourth step is always driving towards um, the emergent patterns at the macro level as you go. That is, I'm, because in each, as I go through each unit, I'm always tracing through how the elements of that, um, that unit are relating or repeated in the rest of the discourse. I'm getting a pretty good idea of the macro level uh, as I go through the text. But the final work is putting all the pieces together in a coherent pattern. So a, I'm, I think I'm going to have some time to talk about um, a significant example of how this worked, uh, of the exegetical payoff of this procedure in my analysis. Again, I'm going to talk about in my analysis of Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 through 2.4. Uh, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 through 2.4 is usually broken up into three distinct units. First of all, 1, 1 through 4 it's always, it's virtually always taken, not always, not anymore, this is starting to change, but it's, it has been most often taken as standing on its own, as this magnificent opening. Uh, but it, it, you can't call it it's an introduction, you can call it an exordium, and that sounds really cool, but uh, it immediately goes to something else. It's an exordium, and then it's followed by this collection of Old Testament quotations, a, a very, a very uh, dense collection of Old Testament quotations um, that uh, just seem to compare Jesus, the Son to angels. And you know, the, it's, it's labeled, oh, this is about the Son is superior to angels. And they say, wow, Hebrews is a lot about superiority. And here after the exordium, we, we get over the exordium and the cool Christology, all of a sudden we're right in the Son is superior to angels. But then you get to 2, 1 through 4, and all of a sudden you have this command. And in the authors exhorting the uh, readers, so what does that have to do with Jesus' superiority to angels? And so um, scholars have traditionally said the author immediately goes off topic. It's the first time he goes off topic, and he's going to do it again and again and again. 
And so, some people uh, even have said these must be two different um, letters that got glued together badly. Um, but uh, my, when I did my cohesion analysis of um, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 through, through um, 2.4, I, uh, I established that the whole thing was one unit just according to the cohesion patterns because in each unit it had this very same participants and the very same process of speech. There is one uh, identifiable topic and it was introduced in the first finite verb clause in 1 1. God spoke in these last times through his son, and, that, and, he, and it was laid in contrast to previous messengers or previous ways or means that God had spoken. So that's exactly the topic that ran through all three, all three subunits um, in that um, God, God was speaking through the son, and it was contrasted with how he spoke through other messengers. And you can see that if you recognize that angels are constrained to refer to, to refer to a prototype or a representative of messengers. And that is part of what an, being an angel means. Sometimes in, um, in the New Testament, in the Septuagint, uh, messengers are called angels. And the, the uh, idea of messenger is pretty essential to the understanding of what an angel is. And so um, it starts with a contrast of the sun with messengers. It further describes the contrast between the sun as a messenger and the role and identity of the angels as messengers. And then with the main clause that's formally highlighted and marked as a conclusion that's grounded or supported by the rest of the unit, um, the message is given uh, in 2, 1 through 4. It is the point of the of the whole unit it's 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 the highlighted main clause it's the very thing that most people think is off topic and that is we must pay most careful attention therefore to what we have heard so that we don't drift away for since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we no ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to, the, to his will. This is a mammoth sentence in Greek. This is the point of what, what has just been discussed in chapter one. And I, I've summarized that as the, 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 the point is the son is God's ultimate messenger. Let's pay attention to the son. So I, I want to give you a summary of the emergent patterns that, that uh, characterize Hebrews according to my analysis. And the first I want, thing I want to talk about is cohesion patterns, and I hope you can follow me on this. But um, there are there are pivots, not breaks, in the transitions of Hebrews, and um, this is another problem for Western scholarship. It's Western scholarship. First thing they do uh, that scholars do is they translate the text. And what do you do when you translate the text? You break it into paragraphs. And, um, and so they often are coming to the text and say, where are the breaks here? And I came to the conclusion that the Hebrews author has written the text in such a way that there are no breaks. There are no real breaks in the, te in the text. It trend, um, the author often will conclude one unit and start the next unit in the same sentence. And so authors spill a lot of ink saying, well, which unit, which unit, or which paragraph does this does this sentence belong to? Does it be? And they'll say it belongs to the previous one. No, it belongs to the following one. And uh, then someone said, you know, there's a break right in the middle of this sentence. Uh, there's a topic break. And my my assertion is there is no break. This is cohesive. And so it's better to describe the transitions from one unit to the next as more of a pivot, as pivotal. And so in my outline, I have things overlapping. Uh, the other thing is that there is, in Hebrews, the repetition and interweaving 
of the topics. Um, they are not compartmentalized um, like we expect in Western scholarship. Uh, one discourse topic or theme, this is where I actually said I should use theme. One discourse theme, uh, there's an interweaving of themes. One discourse theme is supported by the other themes and then you get to the next section and it gets switched and another theme is primary and it's supported by the other themes. But, but the themes all appear together in the different sections and they just are, it's, it, they, they kind of take turns at being the main theme of that section. Um, discourse topic patterns are um, are uh, really interesting, and I hope you can follow me on. I, I I think I will fail to convince you unless you read some of my uh, my other material on this. But um, uh, as I studied it, um, all of a sudden, and I was as I was working through and analyzing with my tools, um, Hebrews three one uh, got my attention. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a Heavenly calling, think about Jesus as the apostle and high priest of our confession. And uh, that's, I, I should call that 3-1-A because that's not the end of the sentence. All of a sudden it goes on to the next topic. But this clearly um, uh, summarizes uh, um, what the author has just been talking about in terms of in this case, in terms of topics, he has just talked about Jesus. Jesus is the messenger. And then he has talked about God's ultimate messenger. Then he said, then he, in my opinion, drops a bombshell and says he's the great high priest. And then he says, okay, so we're, now we're going to have what we call discourse de dexis. I'm telling you how I want you to be thinking here. And uh, first of all, I want you to think of Jesus as, an, as the apostle of our confession. As, as the as the messenger that brought our confession I want you and I want you to think about Jesus as a high priest and I want you to think about yourselves as as partners in Jesus's heavenly calling so if you analyze what I just read you'll see the actual emphasis is on the believers identity and how it wraps into Jesus's identity so we've got these three things going on and so I'm, I'm saying that in 3 1 he pauses and tells you uh, how he's going to talk about his main topics in the discourse I'm calling these topics now so there are three the second thing is is there's discourse dexis in 3 1 and then there are three discourse sections that correspond to the three discourse topics. And those are, first of all, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, 16, where he is uh, talking about the theme about how to consider, think about Jesus as the apostle of our confession. And so not only does it present him as God's ultimate messenger, but then it, but then the, the rest of the uh, that section is saying, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Respond to his voice by entering the rest, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So to me, once I started thinking about this highlighting of Jesus as an apostle, it was apparent that the section was mostly, except for the uh, introduction of Jesus as high priest, it was mostly dedicated to talking about um, how we were supposed to respond to Jesus as a messenger. And then the second section everybody agrees on, uh, they might not agree on where it starts. And I say it starts in 411, notice the overlap, and then runs through 1025, and that section is to consider Jesus as our great high priest. There is no disagreement on that one. Everyone agrees that's what it's about. Now, the third section has been somewhat of a conundrum because most people will say the whole book is about Jesus as a high priest, but he pretty much disappears in the third sect in the third part. 
he's he is definitely not the main participant in the third part um, but but the the main participants are believers and uh, the exemplars for the believers so um, this is indeed concentrating on explaining how believers are partners in Jesus's heavenly calling and now um, Right, discourse prominence um, is is uh, the next thing, and and so I'm going to be a, a pretty pretty brief about this, but I think we're getting. I'm hoping we're not getting too dense, but the commands or the exhortation, the modals, are the marked material consistently through the whole book. They are marked. Uh, they are marked with emphatic markers, they are marked with grammatical structures, and they are marked through repetition, and they are marked through other means. And um, in contrast, the indicative exposition is marked as support materials, most often with a conjunction gar. And as you look at the patterns, what jumps off the page is that there are 12 hortatory subjunctives. And a long time ago, I heard someone say, if you want to know what Hebrews is about, read the let, let us passages, read the hortatory subjunctives. Let's do this, let's do that. And indeed, the hortatory subjunctives are the most prominent parts of the book of Hebrews that are used in a very clear pattern as conclusions and transitions. And so the patterns of the disc of the um, Hortatory subjunctives create discourse peaks at 411 through 16 and 1019 through 25 who, who, that, that break the whole discourse together very neatly into three parts. And, and it, they're, they're impossible to miss. There's triple hortatory subjunctives. And in the Greek, the, the emphasis on these triple hortatory subjunctives is, is remarkable. It doesn't translate well. And these hortatory subjunctives kind of correspond to the three topics. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to um, not say them right now because I have a slide that really focuses in on the, on the three hortatory subjunctives. But they, but they repeat them, they, but they are repeating. Uh, what's, what's repeated, uh, what's given in 411 through 16 is repeated in 10, 19 through 25, with the exception of one paraphrase. Um, and this creates a tripart structure that, like I said, corresponds to the three topics. And then um, the climax of the discourse is actually where you would expect it to be in 12, 1 through 29. And the, the conclusion of 12, 29, the emphatic conclusion, is a, a double hortatory subjunctive in 12, 28. Let's serve God as priests. And actually, uh, technically, uh, technically, and let's have grace. Let's have grace and serve God as priests in heavenly Jerusalem. Now, the, you probably thought that said let's worship in that passage, but the, the word for worship is a technical term in Greek for the service of priests. And so we see that we're partners and uh, we're partners with Jesus in his heavenly calling in regards to sharing the priesthood of the believer. So, so the message of Hebrews, um, uh, I maintain, is, is to answer the question, how do we find God in our time of need? And I draw that from the first set of triple hortatory subjunctives, the very end. Uh, it says, let us then draw near to the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So Hebrews and these triple hortatory subjunctives that, that repeat all the way through Hebrews are answering this question, that are, are giving us the tools that we need to help God in our time of need. And so I'm not going to belabor this too much, but we've got um, all, all the hortatory subjunctives can be categorized into one of three categories. The first one is let's hold on. And that one, it's just repeated three times. Let's hold on to the confession. 
And, and uh, it, that, that is kind of a paraphrase of 2.1 where it says it's necessary for us to pay attention to the things we hear. Let's hold on to the confession. The next one is let's, let's go forward. And, and uh, this is um, always paraphrased. It's the most robust uh, use of metaphors um, in the message. But um, let's move forward. Let's be afraid that none of you uh, fall short of the rest. Let's make sure that let's make every effort to enter the rest. Let's press on to maturity. Let's consider how to stimulate each other to love and good works. Let's run the race. Let's move forward. And the third one is let's draw near to the face of God. And you, uh, you can read that for yourself. But let's draw near to the throne of grace. Let's go into the holy of holies. That's a great one. Um, let's have grace and let's worship God as priests. Uh, and the last is let's go to Jesus outside the camp. All, all about approaching uh, the God in Jesus, who's waiting for us in every case as we draw near. So how do we find God in our time of need? We hold on, we move forward, and we draw near. And if you're not holding on, you're slipping away. If you're not moving forward, you're going backwards. If you're not drawing near, you're shrinking back. And this accounts for all the warnings of Hebrews. So just... Just briefly, I come up with a discourse outline. I had no real way to, re, uh, to present it, but the discourse outline relates the parts to the whole. It shows how the transitions overlap, um, uh, and it shows that the topics and themes of Hebrews, as, as I've represented it, account for all the material, every bit of it, except for the epistolary conclusion, um, and without any, any going off topic. So in conclusion, um, I just want to say that um, the significance of this study has been priceless for me. Um, as a contribution to biblical studies, it's, it's, it's put me in a position where I can move into um, other, other uh, studies of linguistics um, and I can participate fully in a robust discussion on linguistics because I took five years to learn linguistics. And um, I moved straight into intertextuality, and all of a sudden, those troubling passages on Paul and gender, I started to get a, see how I could get a handle on them, for instance, but other passages as well. And its role in my uh, scholarship, in my development, and my, and my devotion, obviously, to the Word of God has been incalculable. I am uh, so glad that uh, God led me in this direction, and as I said, the, pay, the exegetical payoff and the transformation of life has been incalculable.